How's it going, everybody? Everybody's brains full after a, a long day of uh, interesting scripting talks and uh, technical sessions on disk imaging and other things along those lines. Um, this session is not technical. This section, th th this uh, this talk is actually very human oriented. So um, I was going to say we're going to talk about a lot of different stuff, but mostly what it's going to be is how to survive as a solo admin in your environment. How many of you are solo in, uh, solo admins in your environment right now? Fair number. How many of you are uh, consultants? A couple of you here in the house. Awesome. So um, you guys know that most of life looks a little bit like this. <laughs> and it's pretty chaotic, right? I mean, we're dealing with the problem of the day, the next office move, the next vendor crisis, um, the next software crisis, which we had one yesterday. Uh, how many people have read the uh, tech notes on what the flash patch yesterday was for? It's big, hideous, and ugly. So patch your stuff tonight, please, by the way, guys. Thanks. Um, it all comes so fast. It comes at you every day. It's, it's immense. It never feels like there's enough time to take a breath. It never feels time, like there's time to think proactively, um, to work on the future. Uh, but you've taken the first step, and you're here. Um, so I might as well give you some useful information on how to get from here to uh, a functional state as a solo sysadmin. And this is where it gets better. So the best work way that I've heard sysadmin work described is that you're walking a tightrope between two buildings that are on fire. Uh, but that's why we get paid the shiny nickels, right? I mean, they, that's why they sign them up extra nice for us, because they're worth more that way. So, you know, in those particular cases, a lot of our ch we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. And some of those challenges are time management. And some of those challenges are constant churn of updates and improvements and the new version. And Apple seems hell-bent on releasing not just a full release of Mac OS X every year, but a hell-bent on releasing an iOS release also. And chances are, you know, the way that these iOS devices have worked their way into our lives, um, which is awesome, thank you, Apple people who are here and not here, um, because you make cool things that we like to use and that make our lives better. Um, they make our lives as sysadmins maybe just a little more complicated than they were before, because now we don't have one device per person, we have three devices per people. So it's very challenging. If you were supporting an organization of 50 people, that used to mean 50 computers and a server. Maybe a printer, kind of sometimes a copier, usually the fax machine, probably not the overhead projector anymore. Um, but you have this challenge of now you're supporting three times as many devices. And each of the iOS devices has a separate set of restrictions on them, uh, a separate set of software problems. Uh, it's a constant churn. You're also serving many groups in most cases. No two users are alike. Um, you have admin users, you have executive users, you have uh, whatever the business process object user is, be that a teacher, a salesman, a developer, uh, things along those lines. You have many different groups and constituencies that you get to serve as part of this process, right? And you also have to stay ahead of the curve. So who here is running iOS 8 already? Am I it? Okay, one other. How many people are running Yosemite, at least in a VM? Okay, that's a little bit better. So it's one of those places where we have to stay ahead of the curve. We've got to know where the challenges are. So it, we have all of these challenges, and that asks us a question at the end. When do I sleep? I have a nine-month-old named Charlie, and I love him dearly. Um, but, and he's actually pretty good at sleep, and, and for that I thank him. Because um, I think that's pretty awesome because it means we usually get to sleep, but I certainly sleep a lot less now and For once it's not because of work um, So we've got a, all of these challenges. How do we deal with all of these challenges? There are really three levels of thinking and control when it comes to your organization and the first one that we're going to talk a little bit about is strategic control or Don't let the blind man tell you what an elephant is You've heard the joke about the guy who reaches up and grabs the elephant by the ear. He's blind. He tells you, he's got really big ears. I don't know what that's all about. We go places with the joke. It's not terribly interesting or funny, but at least it's better than my TCP IP joke from yesterday. So how do we get a handle on all of this? You start with the basics. You start with the big picture. This is the strategic overview if you want to get technical. You have to know what you have. You have to know where you're going. And you have to know what's immediately next. 
So in this particular case, you have to know what that is that your organization have. What, what are you responsible for? And you probably know all this already, but uh, go with me along on this thought exercise as we go through the part of this process. So the first step is documentation. This is about understanding what's present in your inventory, not just knowing what it is. Um, it, take a searching inventory of all your good stuff. Um, understand it. And don't just write down what you have, write down what it means. Good documentation tells a story to the next person who has your job. Even if you never intend to leave, there's a halfway decent chance in this world that you might get involved in a serious car accident. I was nearly hit by a bus the other day. Um, it's terrifying. And what would I be leaving behind to the person who picks up my job next? We've taken over for several places where um, the sysadmin who had our job before is no longer available to answer our questions, to uh, tell us what the passwords are. And so in those circumstances, what we're left behind with is uh, we're left behind with what's, what their documentation was, which is usually a scribbled out sheet of paper with the IP address, the subnet mask, and if you're very fortunate, the router address. You could probably discern the router address for most of these things yourselves these days, but you know the way that networks are working and uh, the way that ISPs are operating, that's not always the case. How many people have Verizon, Verizon Fios? You may be part of a Class C, you may not know where that router address is. They've been moving it from dot one, which is a little bit weird. When you get the dot one, that was a weird day. Um, and, and so you really have to understand what your network looks like, what your machines look like, and you have to tell it as a story. So we've st I've changed the way that I write my notes now, and I say that the Washington Area Bicyclist Association is a small nonprofit. They have 15 staff. Uh, they have a development director whose name is Blah. They have a uh, you know, CEO whose name is Blah. They have the finance guy who I send the bills to, his name is Blah. And their IP comes from Comcast. Our Comcast rep's name is Mike Kaffer. Here's his email address and his phone number. Um, their IP address is this. Here's the subnet mask. Here's my router IP. Here's the passwords for managing all of the different pieces in that space. It doesn't have to always read like a story, but it's helpful to give people the creative brief when you're looking at an organization, even if it's just your own. So you have to write it down like you're leaving tomorrow and like you're briefing your replacement. Here's the next thing about documentation that um, is going to sound funny coming from a fat guy. Um, documentation is a little bit like fitness. Once you stop, everything spirals out of control in a hurry. So keep writing. And we're going to talk about how you make time to do that here in just a little bit because that's an incredibly valuable part. You may have an organization that you have been working with for 10 years. And in the last year, they've gone through an incredible diversification process. And while they used to make box tops for cereal boxes, now they make Band-Aid boxes. So what's the difference? It's a box, right? Scale's totally different. Manufacturers are totally different. The sales department has changed and has gone from laptops to iPads. Did you write that down? Everybody's got an iPad now. And it's managed with Profile Manager or AirWatch or what have you, instead of being managed by your standard Mac management system. So if you're not keeping up with your documentation, uh, you are, you're not just failing future me, you're failing future next guy. And as a guy who's a future next guy, it's helpful to walk into that place and see some documentation in order. Um, the other thing that you're going to want to talk about is maps. And we try to get a floor map for every one of our clients. And we try to make sure that it's notated. We also try to make sure that, you know, it's not, we don't need to know necessarily who sits where. But it'd be nice to know that sales is in the northeast corner. And it'd be nice to know that that is the wiring room where all the stuff lives. And this closet over in the corner has the second AP. So build those documentation pieces as part of your process. Um, other useful things that are maps are network maps. Uh, we have a couple of uh, people that we work with that have many locations. So knowing how their networks fit together and having a visual representation of that with all of the necessary documentation to go that goes along with that is incredibly helpful. Contacts and contracts. How many people have internet service providers at their business? It's all of you, pretty much. How many of you know how long you are into your contract with that particular ISP? A few of you. 
And I was going to say, what happens when your contract's up? Well, if, you, if you're worth Megapath, for example, um, they jack you up to the per month rate unless you sign another contract. Congratulations, you've cost your business $300 that month by not knowing when the contract is up, not calling your rep and saying, hey, we need another contract. We need a contract extension. We're in this space for another three and a half years. I'd love another two-year contract at the, rate, at the rate that's 10% lower than the one you have right now. So those are the kind of things that you've got to write down. You've got to know who your contacts are. Um, I have a purchasing agent. I know her for 800 number by heart. It's 888-800-0030. And when I get to Ann, she fixes my stuff. She buys stuff for me. I want my next person to know what Ann's number is because Ann's pretty awesome. And so if I'm gone, I want that next person to be able to have someone who takes care of them as well as I do. So uh, you have to start thinking about other things like that because these are the big daddies of them all. You can lose somebody's contact and contract. You can figure that out. You can derive that later. If you do not have the passwords, the keys, and the credentials, your next person is probably going to have to tear down more than, you have, uh, more than they can rebuild. And it's really difficult. So how do you store stuff like this? Um, I'm going to say that the best way to do that is to save it, print it, encrypt it, and store it elsewhere. So I, I was going to say, I have a couple of different master passwords that are written down on an index card that I check every six months because they get, end up getting changed at some point and I forget about it. So I write that down on an index card and it lives in the safe at my house. And we encourage our clients to act the exact same way. So we try to keep a document up to date. We try to leave a copy on file with their HR department who usually has the most secure storage because HR, because of all of the personally identifying information that goes along with being in an HR department, has oftentimes lock and key storage. You hope, not always. Um, and so in a lot of those cases, what you're trying to do with this know what you have process is reorient yourself to what your situation is. This is reassessing which building you are in while you are on the tightrope walking across. You're figuring out where you're going. You know what you have. I have a large balancing pole. <laughs> I have some special shoes with magnets on them, I guess, and I have a parachute. Um, so you have to know what's, what's in your environment. You have to have a good handle on what that is. So that's documentation uh, of many different types. And each of these are you know, a big part of that. So the other part that you have to do is you have to know where you're going. This may mean a lot of tedious meetings. I'm sorry, but it does. Uh, the only way that you, you really understand where your company is going is by talking to the people who run your company. That may not be you. You run your IT department. It is your job to keep the fleet of machines in the field running active and obvious. And knowing where your organization is moving gives you everything you need to survive the onslaught. Because again, we're in that zombie position all the, all the time where there's the zombie hordes. Wouldn't it be great if you knew that there were 20 weeks between the zombie hordes? and that you could figure out, at least for the most part, that you've got a 20-week cycle here before you have to bring onboard 30 new staff. Sometimes it's not 20 weeks, sometimes it's two. But that's two more weeks than you knew about. And you know, one Friday the afternoon, you know, Friday in the afternoon, they said, oh yeah, we got 20 new people starting Monday because we're expanding on this extra contract. So yeah, this means going to meetings, but it also means that you get access to some of the business roadmaps that are associated with your organization. And it means that you have to be involved in your budgetary planning cycle and your expansion planning cycle, or heaven forfend your contraction cycle. And so you need to be part of these meetings because you're an organizational part of the, organi uh, of the business that you're in. You are the operations arm. You empower the people that do the stuff that make them the money that pays you, right? So. It, it behooves you to be involved in those environments. And it also builds allies. And if you have allies, you have friends, you have people that are going to look out for you. Um, and if you say, hey, look, I can really plan better if I've got five days worth of notice before a new staffer comes on site so that I can A, make sure that one of our current machines can be adapted for them, or B, order a new piece of hardware, or C, if they have special needs, take care of those special needs well in advance of their arrival on their first day. Because there is nothing worse than showing up on the first day of work and saying, we've got a whole bunch of paperwork for you, but then your computer hasn't come in yet. I'm really, really sorry but your stuff isn't ready. So they can't work on day one. Because really, think about it. 
how many places out there, I mean, with, with the exception perhaps, perhaps being schools, although I wouldn't certainly expect a school not to issue a, a teacher a computer of some sort, how many people, how many have places have workforces that are useful without some form of technology in their hands? You've got to be part of the communications infrastructure at least. You've got to have a phone on the desk or a phone in the hand that actually lets you talk to other people. So the only way to travel Red Route 1 at 20 knots to escape the American submarines is to have hyper-accurate maps of the underwater canyons that you're traveling through. My dad and my brother were submariners. They were reactor. My dad's a reactor operator. My brother manages a diesel engine um, aboard a submarine. And what they have is they can't see what's in front of them, but they have a really, really good road map. That's a hell of a lot like being an IT guy. They can't see what's immediately in front of them, but they have a good map for where they're going and a really good un operational understanding of how to get there. So if you want to do Red Route 1 at 20 knots and find me a business today that doesn't want to do that, then you've got to have good maps. So again, we're in the big picture section. This is the strategic thinking section. So we've got to know what's next. And some of this is actually just sitting down with one of those big annual calendars and figuring out what your annual workflow schedule looks like, at least a little bit, right? Apple's kind of fallen into that process where we get a new Mac OS and a new iOS sometime anywhere between August and uh, October, usually. Um, so you know that that's coming. You can kind of say, OK, this is probably when we need to start thinking about testing the next version of Mac OS X which is usually the day after WWDC comes out, right? Um, other manufacturers may follow suit. I mean, if you look at Office for the Mac, Office for PC, it's Office 2007 and Office 2008. It's Office 2010 and Office 2011. Office 2013 came out last year. Microsoft has said that there's going to be an Office something for Mac this year. Maybe it's called 2014. So you've got to start thinking about what your upgrade process is, because at some point, Office 2011 is going to stop working. Do you want that to be the day that you figure that out? No, you want to have a, you want to have a plan for going forward. So if you're not planning your testing for Yosemite right now, when are you deploying Yosemite? Are you going to deploy Yosemite like some organizations might have this coming past spring, when it kind of settled out at 10.91, 10.92? Because uh, that was one of the choices that we made for some of our clients was that, yeah, you can upgrade right away. We'll, we'll support you. We'll, we'll be there. But we'd really like you to wait until there's a dot release or a dot release or two, just to kind of let everything settle out. We've done some testing. These are the things that we like. These are the things that we don't like. And those are the kind of things that your users are going to ask you. Because some of your users are probably going to try and circumvent your systems of control if you have them and do it anyway. And you have to know what those patterns are going to look like so you know where to expect that. So if you have big conferences every year, I used to work with an organization that had a really, really, really big conference every January. They had other meetings uh, throughout the summer because they were an educational organization. They worked with teachers. When are teachers most available? In the summer, on spring break, or near Thanksgiving. And so we knew when that their big meetings were and we knew when that they would be under the most stress and could least afford any kind of disruption in their lives. Uh, and so that was when we wouldn't deploy giant updates to them that might potentially hurt their workflow, that might potentially break their systems, that might potentially do a lot of things in that particular space. So, sorry, I didn't advance my slides there. So. Um, it, if you, have, you also have to have a really good understanding of where your tactical weaknesses lie. And that may be inexper inexperienced end users. That may be, I have an old Wi-Fi network that maybe only does BG. Uh, I may also have an old you know, a wired network. We only got Cat5 in the wall, so we really only are deploying Gig E. We really can't go anywhere without a major upgrade. Um, and even Gig E might not be at full performance. So you have to know where your potential lynch you know, your, your pinch points are going to be in your particular situation. So that's going to help you determine what happens next, and that's that you're going to make a plan. It doesn't have to be incredibly detailed. You do not have to put in your, main, in your primary plan how you're going to do each of the things that we're going to talk about you wanting to do, right? So 
The first thing you're going to do is you're going to block problem times from your uh, upgrades and updates calendars. So that if you know you have an annual meeting in the first week of January every year, you stop your updates two weeks out. You freeze the systems. Unless there's a major security flaw or things along those lines, you, otherwise you run the risk of really uh, kind of throwing somebody for a loop when they can least be, afford to be thrown a loop because then it's... The, the thing about that is that you don't, you, they don't blame the people that deserve it, which is the software people. They blame you for updating their computer. And that is a crappy situation to be in because you don't have anybody, anybody, any other way out. You're the IT guy. It is your job to make computers work well. And sometimes that means freezing the update schedule. Block time for budgeting periods. Every organization's got an annual budget. If you're five people, if you're 50, if you're 500, if you're 5,000, you have an annual budgeting period, find out when it is, and block some time off your schedule so that you can talk about your future budget. Because you need to know what your expenditures look like. And you need to know that I have 25 people whose machines are four years old now, but I only have in the budget 23 people, or 23 people's worth of money to buy new machines. Which means I either need to change the specs and make my stuff fit the budget, beat the crap out of my vendor for another 2%, or another, I'm sorry, another 4% so that you can get under your number. But the thing is, you need to be involved in those processes, whether you like it or not. It may, I know that we didn't sign up so that we could all do spreadsheets and Excel budgets and all of these things, that that wasn't the part of this job that looked good to us. We took the job because, you know, we love computers, right? Okay, maybe not. But it's what we do. And this is, has to be a part of what we do. So the other thing you need to look at is start to chart your update patterns. In the workshop yesterday on Mac admin fundamentals, we talk a little bit about how many updates we've seen in a year. We're at 10.9.4, so that means that there have been five point releases of Mavericks in the last year. There have been, as of yesterday, 15 releases of Flash, seven releases of Office. I, and I was going to say, I, I count, on countless you know, versions of other things, seven versions of Java 7, for example. And, you know, there are a lot of things along, uh, you know, in that space that you're going to need to account for. So you need to start looking at your update cycles. And if you can find a good pattern in there, operate on that pattern. Plan around that pattern. And if it gets disrupted, disrupted you'll at least have planned for a pattern because no, ba no, you know, no plan of attack is going to survive the, the field of battle. So this is the other piece. You're going to need to include some time off because you're going to need it. So you get as part of your compensation from your organization an amount of leave. That might be two weeks, it might be three weeks, it might be five weeks. If you don't use it, sometimes you lose it, which means you have written a check back to your employer. So you need to talk with them about how you actually do that. That's going to be a challenge. That may be one of the most interesting conversations you have with your organization because they understand it's part of your compensation package. And you need to be upfront with them and say, I have leave that I must use. Or one, you're not going to want me around here. Because <laughs> I know that somebody who is, uh, who is under vacationed or under broken at that point in terms of under having a break, um, yeah, that's a problem for your organization. And that's something that you've got to work yourself around. When you feel yourself starting to get burned out, start to look around and see, see when you can actually grab a day or grab a couple days or grab a long weekend. Because you've got to build that time into your schedule as well. So the other thing you're going to do is you're going to make a calendar that goes with this. This is my new maintenance calendar for one of our clients. And that looks like a weekend sit rep at, at 8.30 in the morning on Mondays. We've got a focus check at 8 a.m. on Tuesday. An auto package run and test at 11 a.m. on Tuesday. Management meeting at 3 o'clock. Configs review on Wednesday. Auto package deploy on Thursday, backups check and time and sheets and expenses on Friday. So this is one of those things where it, it's, you're not going to hit all of these targets because life is crazy, right? You never know when someone's going to drop their machine or you get a random thing. But it's good to have a framework in place so that you know what the rhythm of your organization is. If you've got some people that you know, don't touch their computers all weekend, turn them on Monday morning. You might have problems to deal with. I call it a sit rep situation, where you take a situation report. Sometimes it'll take five minutes. Sometimes it'll take two hours. And you kind of go through the weekend's email. You kind of go through your help desk ticket status. And you start to build yourself a, a, a plan to go forward. 
Next up is your focus check. We'll talk more about focus in a minute, but this is time when your phone and your email go away and you close your browser windows and you work on the future. It doesn't have to be long, needs maybe an hour, maybe two, but your organization will not miss you for that minimal amount of time. They will not miss you for that minimal amount of time. If they need you, they can come knock on their door, on your door, rather. But you can step aside and plan for the future in those one to two hours a week and really pick up an extra skill, an extra tool, and start to build yourself a, plan, you know, a better plan for going forward. So what I like to try and do is, a, is an auto package test run at Tuesday, on Tuesday, give or take. Again, update Tuesday. We always see updates on Tuesday. Um, it's nice to, at that point, kind of go through and figure out what, you know, what's going to be in the catalog this week. Maybe roll out a few of those uh, updates to your test users. And if you don't have test users, you might want to think about how you build a few in. You roll them out and say, new software, how'd it go? And then you've got 48 hours to really let them test and be in that space before you roll it out to the rest of your enterprise. Um, I, I, I put the management week meeting on here as a bi-weekly thing, just as a check-in. Um, we have one client that really likes to hire new people a lot. There were five people when, we, when they found us in 2010. They hired their 110th person the other day. So immense growth all the time. They grow really big, and they're going to do it again this summer. So we try to keep that on our radar so that we make sure that they've got the hardware stock to deal with that. Or that they know that one of their contracts is coming up for rebid, and there's a chance that they might lose 20 people's worth of funding. So they've got to be ready for that. So understanding what their challenges are going to be, because they're your challenges too. They're management's challenges, but they're your challenges. And you can decide. You, you get to figure out how you get to help in that space. So configs review. Um, what I talk about with a configs review is that you take a look at your firewall switch, other firmware objects, and you take a look at the configurations. Have they changed since the last time you looked at them? If so, save a copy, drop it in a backup file. file. Because in the rush of fixing something, you might not back the device up at that point. So go through and review your configs for the things that have been touched. Save a copy of those configs someplace on your server or someplace that's going to get backed up. And you know, change your documentation again to match. And that doesn't take long, especially in an organization of 50 to 100 people. You might only have five switches, six APs, a router, and you know, some server equipment. If you've got more than that, it's going to take more time. But this is valuable for you to do, especially because those devices get touched more than we'd like to think. And backing them up is incredibly valuable. And they also tend not to be much on the way of disk space. In a lot of these cases, a lot of those config files are um, you know, small. So now that we've kind of worked through our way through the big picture, let's talk a little bit about tactical control. And it's not just where you put your photon torpedoes. Um, it, Tactical control is the short term. This is between now and Friday, uh, now and next week. So we're not talking here about you know the ticket system, fixing someone's email, dealing with the CFO's laptop woes. We're talking about tasks that are about uh, disaster prevention here. We're talking about checking the backup logs. We're talking about saving the switch configs. Uh, we're talking about updating the paper copy of your master file and making sure that that's present. We're talking about doing your expenses and your timesheets. You have to save time for those kind of things. Once you have that inventory of tasks, list those strategic tasks with their frequencies and start to build yourself that same calendar. Don't just list the stuff you're, that you're doing right now. Be aspirational. List the stuff that you're doing in the long, that you want to be doing that you're not doing already. There we go. One more. There we go. So we're going to take a pause. The, the, the term I'm using up here is Cesura. Uh I'm a music guy. I sing. So uh, I was going to say the double dash up at the top of the bars that says take a breath. So let's see. We're going to talk about writing things down. Anybody a Field Notes brand user? Couple here in the house. So this is the uh, fall, or I guess the summer collection, late, late spring collection. Um, they, do a, they, they do a fun, uh, you know, collectible notebooks kind of thing where they ship you a box about once every three months and you get different notebooks. The, f the winter one was a really cool one with a star pattern. And uh, this, this Springs was actually wood bound. So this is single ply maple on the front, which is kind of neat. You get notebooks. But what we're talking about here is 
I'm not writing it down to remember it later. I'm writing it down to remember it now. Oh, someone plugged in an airport. Sorry about that. Yeah, everybody's machine that was nearby just flicked open the airport utility. Yeah, we should find that person and explain to them that may, may not be polite. Um, but that's the whole point. I'm not writing it down to remember it later. I'm writing it down to remember it now. That's a huge part of the process. So why do we still use paper in an era where bits are essentially free? And it's because the physical act of writing it down not typing it, but I mean, and this may change for, for the, for my son who is, you know, who may never, you know, spend a lot of time learning to write with a pencil, but may spend his time tapping things out on a keyboard. I don't know where the education system is going, but that physical act of writing down notes and doing it the old fashioned way has value. So I'm going to encourage everybody have a system of some sort for you know, taking notes in your meetings and tracking your actions, whether that's Behance, whether that's uh, Evernote, Field Notes, a yellow notepad, everybody loves the old composition books. You can have a Trapper Keeper. I'm not gonna say no to Trapper Keeper because apparently there are new Trapper Keepers out there. I don't know about these things. But you gotta have a system to handle that and be accountable for that. So when you are in a meeting with management, when you're in a meeting with a, a department, put the laptop away because that's a source of disruption. You can write things down really, really fast that way. You can tap things out. I type faster than I handwrite by a good margin. But by the same token, I have the ability for to be bothered. Email can pop in. IMs, tweets, Facebook, all of these things can pop up in my alerts. And then I have lost my focus. I'm overthinking about that new picture of my nephew or that tweet about my sports team or you know the text message that I got because it comes in through iMessage. When I have this, there's only me in the paper. So ideally any note-taking environment is something that you can back up. So this isn't so back upable at least. So it, it, you may want to think about having a process whereby, and you know, Evernote's really handy for this. Evernote is great. You take a picture of the paper, it goes into Evernote, and then sometimes if you have neat handwriting, or if your handwriting at least isn't as much of an abomination as mine, um, it can transcribe for you and turn that into useful text. So having a process whereby you debrief yourself by looking at your paper file and turn it into a digital file could be super helpful. So the other thing, the other part that we're going to talk about, not just written stuff, but the short term, um, is going to be building yourself up a reminder schedule. These calendars should be separate from any of the other calendars you operate. My maintenance calendar is not my main calendar. My main calendar has all of my appointments on them, but my maintenance calendar is separate. And the reason for that is one, so that I don't necessarily get marked as busy during those times, because then I can flex my maintenance schedule around other meetings that have to happen at those given times. But that you get something that you can also turn off when you need to think about the long picture. So you're gonna wanna add reminders on your phone that are location-based or time-based. The reminders app on the iPhone is super killer. And it is really a great way to kind of go through your schedule and it talks with your, it talks with your Mac. That's only getting better in Yosemite and iOS 8. That's going to be a lot more um, diligent in terms of reminding you of things. So once you have that schedule of reminders in your calendar, and once you have that calendar separate from your other calendars, here's the hard part. You actually have to do the stuff. Do the thing. You can do the thing. Sometimes the thing takes five minutes, sometimes it takes an hour and a half. It will get better over time, but if you honor and respect that calendar and you're honest with yourself when you're setting it up, you are going to have a much better experience. So sometimes it's easy to set these things up as first thing in the morning kind of things. I know that the rhythm of some of my offices is that they start the work day at eight and they barrel through until about two o'clock and then things get quiet. So for them, I schedule stuff in the afternoon because then I've got more focus time with individual people when they're not super, super crazy busy. Um, other of our clients, they don't start till 11. I work, I work with a couple of clients in the nightclub industry. So getting those people before noon, forget it. 
Um, but that also means that they're not in their email at 7 a.m. or 9 a.m. or even 10 a.m. And you've got access to their systems when you can be effective. So set these times first thing in the morning, last thing before you leave. Those are those kind of things, and you know, function in your space. Now, focus time. But you have to build yourself some focus time every week, every single week. And this doesn't have to be, uh, this is the one you may need help to implement. And you may have to ask the forbearance of management during this process. Um, so, but again, you've started to build allies. You're going to more meetings. You're saying, I can be more effective to my organization if I have an hour and a half to two hours of focus time every week when my phone is on do not disturb, my cell phone is in my bag, my laptop is either off or in essentially do not disturb mode with you know, email closed, IM closed, Skype closed, whatever other tools you're using to interact with your, your environment closed so that you can focus on this stuff. If you take nothing away else from today, if you decide that schedule is hokey, if you decide that going to meetings is for the birds and you're comfortable working outside of that space, if you take nothing else that I say seriously this week, do this. Build yourself focus time. And build it so that nobody can get in your way unless there's some emergency. Because we all are used to, we are the firefighters. When the bell rings, we got to go. But we get to decide sometimes when that bell rings and what's really important. So be aware of that. It has to be time that is disruption free. <laughs> Funny, right? No, seriously, it has to be disruption free. This should be weekly time spent on the bigger picture items and the longer term goals. So this is about your strategic view. This is not about tactical. This is not about making it to Friday or making it to next Tuesday or making it to the next upgrade. This is about when is your organization's lease up on their space? I work with a lot of small businesses. Our clients move on average every three years. So every year, if we have 40 clients, we're doing 10 office moves. And Man, you want to talk about a bananas project. An office move is a full-on bananas project because you've got to find the, you may or may not know if there's bandwidth at the new space. You may not know if there's a server closet at the new space. Did they include wiring in your architect's plans? Are, are you inheriting a space? Do you have to keep it as is? Are you looking for a space with a skiff? You know, things along those lines? You've got challenges that the people who make those decisions may not be aware of. Being, making that as part of your process Making that part of your focus time is really helpful. Um, how many of you still have 1068 servers in the wild? Oh, wow. OK, that was more than I expected. Um, I suppose I should raise my hand, too. Um, but there are X serves out there. there are, I've still got a Mac Pro server that's running 1068 server. And you have to start thinking about what happens when it dies. Because we are now, in many cases, at five years on that hardware. Some of those drives may start and be spindle, may have spindleware. Um, who knows what the state of the power supply is? While they built those machines to last, what does last look like? And more importantly, since you can't buy another one, well, you can. You can buy it on the used market, but that's a Band-Aid, right? So how do I think about getting out of my Band-Aid situation and building a new home for my organization? So that's what your focus time is for. Again, this isn't, we're not talking whole days. We're not talking, you know, huge swaths of time where you're not reachable to your organization. Because when you're not reachable to your organization, you're not necessarily a resource for them. Um, you have to focus on a lot of those pieces. You got you to gotta chart it. You got to make sure that people know about it so that they don't freak out when at 8.30 on Tuesday, when you decided that that's when focus time is, they can't reach you. You can put a sign on your door that says, I am in focus, or um, I'm, yeah, I'm underwater, or something like that. You've got to come up with a, 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 a sign that tells your cohorts that this is the time that you're thinking about the big picture, and that the little problem, the list is really important, don't matter right now. That's a hard sell sometimes. So again, if I'm telling you to take one big thing away, I'm telling you to take the hardest thing and that when you do the hardest thing, everything else will come behind it. But this is the most important thing that you do, is find that time. Now, I know for the consultants in these positions, focus time may not be billable time. So 
How do you handle that? Come see me afterwards, and I'll explain. But it's worth the cost. It is 100% worth the cost, because then you have a much better, you have a, much, a house and more organization, and that's important. So operational maintenance. Um, and think of operational maintenance as our third. This is beyond the tactical. This is what's happening in the next hour, day, that kind of thing. We've talked about the week. We've talked about the month slash year. This is the stuff that's keeping the ship right. So this is reacting with intent. And in those particular cases, this is a very Zen thought. And uh, for those of you not deeply familiar with Zen and the art of the IT maintenance, um, or Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, I highly encourage you to find that old 70s wonder and understand that it is how your, your, your life operates. There are a lot of parallels in those particular spaces. So if you're reacting with intent, that means not patching your machines every day. That means not disrupting a work environment unless you have a really compelling reason to do that. This means reacting not as a knee jerk, but with focus and engagement. And sometimes, yes, if the CFO's machine just crashed and he's in budget season, you run. But that does not mean that you should not ask questions first. Like, did you just plug it into the 240 outlet in your house? Because then you know. You have questions. You can be inquisitive. with that, And step aside from the emergency for the moment. Because reacting with intent is about making your users more comfortable. How many people in this room have ever talked with the doctor that they were essentially asking advice from and the doctor was, um, shall we say, nervous slash agitated? Yeah, that's not a good feeling. There is never anything that's got, you are not at ease anymore. Take the time, pause, summon a deep breath, and treat the situation with intent. Ask clear questions. Focus on the user's problem. Put everything else aside at that moment. Minimize your IMs, minimize your email, open a new help desk ticket if that's how your organization operates, and focus just on them and react with intent. So one of the other parts of, of reacting with intent is that you get to test often and deploy once. So again, if you haven't stood up a virtual machine for every operating system that you support, do that right now. Do not wait until Monday. Do that while you're here. There's plenty of bandwidth here, so if you need a copy of Mountain Lion or Mavericks or even Yosemite, um, maybe not right now do, do that. Wait until this evening. But again, we got all that bandwidth. He was talking about 95 megabytes per second, which is just a shade under 760 megabits per second. So you've got some options in that particular space. Um, Test often and deploy once. Don't get in the habit of deploying multiple times unless it's a hot fix or things along those lines. You get a new version, that kind of stuff. Don't tempt the demon Murphy. <laughs> this is my favorite Murphy's Law photo. This is a <laughs> wine label. <laughs> and it's perfect. I think that this is probably one of the best marketing gags I've seen in a long time. Um, but in this particular case, don't, tempt, don't be in the business of tempting Murphy. Patch nothing on the Friday before your vacation. <laughs> and so it, it, my favorite story about this is actually one from my own personal life. Um, I was married on a Sunday afternoon and on a Monday morning, the day I was supposed to start my honeymoon, I got a call from, at the time, my biggest client. And it was the secretary and she apologized before she said anything else. She says, Tom, I'm so sorry. I know you got married this weekend. First, how was the wedding, blah, 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 blah. So I know you left me the information for your, your coverage, but um, here's the thing. I don't so much have email right now. We patched the server the week before. The, uh, any Zimbra users in the house? Anybody who's ever run a Zimbra server? A couple people. Do you ever wonder what happens if the store directory is on an external volume and that volume doesn't show up when you boot the mail server? Karyo creates the new Karyo creates a folder at that location, and it starts to fill it with new email. All old email is forgotten, forever, until you remount the volume, combine the two mail stores by hand, 
Uh, and it's a wonder that I'm still married to my wife. Um, she's a very kind and thoughtful woman who forgave me for ruining the first day of our honeymoon by spending it fixing the mail server. So again, respect the demon Murphy, and he will not mess with you quite so much. Um, set yourself up for success, not for failure. So, the ongoing life. Your job now is to be a triage nurse. Is it on fire? Fix it now and fi fi fix it first and fix it now. Don't wait five minutes. Go over and talk to the user. Find out what happened. Ask questions. Fix it. Again, the thing is, your organization's priorities are your priorities now. That's what they pay you for. So you have to help establish, as part of those things, what, who the priority users are. So occasionally, your priorities may supersede because they are paying you for your knowledge and your experience as well as your organizational ta talents. So be aware that someone who says they have an emergency may not have a superseding emergency if you are dealing with another bigger problem. And you should not feel the need to abandon a more important task to help someone who thinks that their world is on fire. That said, button up as quick as you can and get to them next. Have an issue tracker of some sort. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about more, more about issue trackers, which are different than trouble trackers or ticket, ticketing systems. Issue trackers are different. Have an issue tracker. It will help you spot the patterns. And that's the kind of institutional knowledge you need. The other thing is you have to build yourself sit rep time when you know that issues are going to be coming in. If you have a staff meeting every Wednesday, that's usually when you're going to be in there dealing with a bunch of issues that are going to happen right after that. So block yourself an hour and a half after the staff meeting and say, come see me after the staff meeting. I'm more than happy to walk you through your issues. Or if you've got a situation where people are traveling a lot and you know that they're always going to be in the office every third Monday, block yourself off time. Don't schedule your focus time for them because then you're taking away from the only time that you get with certain users. So build yourself sit rep time when you know issues are going to come in. So the other thing that we all have to do regularly, frequently, did yesterday with Flash is handle updates. Find a schedule that works for you for handling updates. Roll out to your testing users ahead of your main cadre of users and test your own updates. Really important to say that. Dog food your updates on your machine so that you know what your users are going to go through. And don't just install them and go about your day. Open the app afterwards. <laughs> Make sure that Word still launches. For example, one of my favorite bugs was that the, I think it was the Word 1441 update. If you applied it directly after you, you installed the, uh, the, the Office for the first time and you didn't open Office as an intermediary, you just patched it. So if you've got a brand new machine, you put 1441 in your monkey repo right after 1430. If you install 1430, then 1441, congratulations, you're being asked for the serial number. What's the serial number on your volume licensed version of Office? There isn't one. <laughs> So in those particular circumstances, you have to test your own workflow. And that includes parts of your workflow that your users may not experience often, such as imaging of, or I'm sorry, installation of new software during a no image process, um, and uh, erase and install parts of an imaging process. Test those things once in a while so that you have a good feeling for what that's like. And then lastly but not leastly, freeze your, uh, your releases ahead of busy times. We're going to pause. Cicero for a second, and we're going to talk about playing outside your specialty. I'm a liberal arts major. I study political science and vocal performance at Denison University. Uh, Joe Wollard, who is from Denison, is here this week, and it's always nice to see him. I always like seeing all, our alma mater do well, but there is nothing that reminds me more of that than the fact that I'm a, I'm a liberal arts major. I studied political theory. <laughs> I now have a master's in history of technology from Virginia Tech, where again, I studied the how we made technology, not how technology works. So we're all technical folks, wh whether we like to admit it or not. We're not development staff. We're not sales. We're not teachers. We're not principals. We're not janitors, for the most part. There are some exceptions. And for you, I say, congratulations. You have moved into an interesting and exciting field that mostly looks better on fire. So accept uh, that 
we have to understand every part of the organization that we support. We have to understand what the development staff need, the sales staff need, the um, business object, whether that's teaching, whether that's engineering, whether that's any of those particular, we have to understand what their needs are. We have to understand how they do their job. But we're technical people, right? So uh, playing politics is the worst part of our job. It's still part of our job, so you might as well get good at it. You might as well stop and listen. You might as well stop and talk with someone and find out how they got to be doing what they're doing. Um, one of my most interesting clients is the 930 Club in DC. And uh, there are some really fun people who work at the 930 Club. And my favorite of them is Ed Stack. Ed's the GM of the 930 Club. And if you ever see Ed, Ed's about six foot five. He's got long black hair that he always wears a cap over. And he kind of stands there. He's got a mustache, and he kind of stands there, and he kind of does stuff. And you talk to Ed, and then you realize that not only is Ed a really talented um, uh, general manager of a, of a nightclub, he's fluent in Russian and German. He's an incredible scuba diver. And those are the kind of things that he does. He takes off for Bel Air, for, or Bon Air, sorry, um, for two weeks every year. And you bond with Ed, and you talk with Ed, and you learn stuff about what Ed does. You learn where Ed's pain point is. And that Ed's pain point is that he needs this camera to work. And that if you can make Ed happy, you're making the camera work. So now I know what takes Ed's stress level down. And that so that when I'm talking with Ed, I can tell him, we've taken steps to do this so that I get paged if something ever happens to that. Ed's a lot more at ease at that point. Not that Ever's, Ed, Ed is not at ease, I guess. Ed's probably about the most easygoing guy you'll ever meet. He also has one of the hardest jobs out there. So you have to be involved in the lives of your users. You have to. They're your coworkers. You're supporting them. You're, it's your job to make their job easier. So be involved in their lives and find out what makes their job easier. Sometimes it's making sure that the camera works. Sometimes it's making sure that their laptop is ready to go to overseas on a moment's notice, be file vault encrypted all the time. And by the way, you know, make sure that there's virus protection because they're going to Eastern Europe. Even on a Mac, you gotta worry about that stuff. That their firewall's turned on and everything's set to Macs. That they're not set to join uh, unopened or open Wi-Fi networks. So uh, there's a lot involved there. So we've talked a lot about um, how you stay sane in a, in a very particular way. This is the way that has helped me kind of keep my shit together, excuse me, keep my stuff together. So we're gonna talk about something, some of the useful tools that I use to do that. First up is Omni Outliner. I wrote this talk in Omni Outliner. And Omni Outliner is, I don't know, 50, 100 bucks, give or take, from the Omni Group Corporation. If you're not using also Omni Disk Sweeper as IT guys and gals, you should have it. It's super helpful at finding where, where the user hid their giant iTunes library that's now taking up 90% of their disk space. And that you can see that, you can point at them and say, the wire is 90 gig. iDevice backups. iDevice backups is another great spot in that space. But anyway, we're going back to Omni Outliner, which is what's up on the screen right now. Um, it's great for notes and organization. This is a useful tool that I use frequently to kind of organize thoughts about long-term planning for a specific organization. It's also really great at creating checklists. Um, you can create to-do lists that have check boxes. It's, it's a really stupid thing that they do that makes it super, super helpful to me. Um, it also now supports inline images and files. Drop a PDF in there, no problem. It's stored inside the document bundle. Drop an image file, it displays inline or it shows up as a link. So you can drop your maps in there if you need to. Um, it also has style guides and audio annotations so that you can actually talk to your computer and you get a recording, right? That's something OneNote's done for years and years and years and hasn't gotten any credit for. So thank you, Microsoft, for actually building a really cool product in OneNote. OmniGraffle. This is what I build my network maps and flows in. It's like Visio, but for the Mac and way cheaper. Um, supports multiple layers, supports Visio export. For those of you using the Pro version, which I want to say is $199. Again, still a bargain at any price. Um, it's got template support so that you can build a template for each of your departments or your organizations or your clients so that you've always got a map template that in this case shows you the Cox modem, the router, the airport, the mini and the phone system and the DHCP range. So that you've got that at a moment's notice if you have to turn it over for whatever reason. 
I love VMware Fusion. I know that there are some parallels folks in the house. I'm a VMware guy. Don't explain, I can't explain it. I just feel like it works better. Um, but you can see that I've got my four VMs on my MacBook Pro. And I use them all, pretty much all the time. Um, if you want to see Monkey in a Box, I've got it demonstrated on, a, on, a, on the 10.9 box that's there. It runs in five minutes and 43 seconds over a decent internet connection, and poof, you're using Monkey. So there's, you, there, there's a lot of flexibility here for user testing, um, including Windows testing, because you're going to have one Windows user out there, whether you know it or not, at least in your organization. And this is a good way to test uh, Yosemite. So I strongly recommend that. Um, the folks at Bare Bones built Yojimbo as a tech info library center. You can put notes in it, you can put passwords in it, you can put serial numbers in it, which is super cool. Um, it's also password protected so that you can have a, either the password stored in your keychain or not. And you have access to store p encrypted passwords within that larger encrypted file. So it's tremendous. I want to say it's 50 bucks. Um, but again, everything Rich and his group does at Bare Bones is something that I will buy because they're really talented and they build useful, cool stuff. Other stuff that can be helpful, Evernote. Um, again, it's an online service with a desktop application, a lot like Dropbox is. Um, it's a good place to store notes and places and notebooks. And there's also a premium model available that gives you more storage and more features and stuff like that. Look at that. Um, Pingdom is another thing that I use for monitoring. Um, we've got 20 checks at Pingdom that check every 15 minutes so that I get paged when somebody's internet goes out. Um, it's got pager functionality now. They just got bought by SolarWinds, so I'm not sure what that's going to do to the whole cheap cost thing. Yeah, probably. So be aware. Um, one of the other things that we're just adapting to is now Watchman monitoring. How many people are familiar with uh, Watchman monitoring? Fair number of hands. It's a really kick-ass little suite. It's a little agent that, you, one, you can get customized. So if you buy it for your organization, you customize it with your logos and your logo types, and it, tell, and it basically lets you monitor an entire fleet. So it tells you when the machine fails its first smart disk check. Super helpful. Tells you when somebody reaches 90% hard drive capacity. Tells you when other problems go wrong. If, you can also set it to tell you when somebody reboots. So if you can see five reboots in 20 minutes, you know you have a problem before they even, they even pick up the phone. You can call them and say, hey, I see you're having trouble. Is everything OK? You get to be psychic for just a little bit. And that's something you can't really pay a lot for. You, know, you, you can't pay enough for. And this has the benefit of up to 75 computers. I want to say it's like 20 or 25 bucks a month. Um, so if you have a medium or small organization, this is a humdinger of an app. Um, Again, we talked about uh, trouble trackers, or I'm sorry, issue trackers versus ticket trackers. Fresh Service is a cloud-based help desk. Um, it's meant for places that have multiple levels of support, but also have multiple kinds of support. Um, it includes a knowledge base. It also has an asset discovery system, which is kind of nifty that I haven't played with yet. Um, but I understand you run an agent uh, on one machine on your network, and it figures out who everybody else is and adds them to your inventory system. Spiffy. Um, it also includes um, solutions so that you can say, I fix this problem by doing X. If you have a counterpart or if you are leaving your organization for a week on vacation and you've hired somebody as a temp or you are working with another consultant or you're, you they give them access to your solutions library. And so that they can see that when somebody went into the parallels tools and changed the password for the user, that if it doesn't show up again, you do the following five things. So it's a really nice piece of software. It's not terribly expensive if you have a if it's just you or just you and a couple of other techs. So, who rides a bike? I ride a bike. I like my bike a lot. Get outside. Go for a bike ride. Step away from the computer at least once a day, close your lid, talk to somebody, go for a walk, take a bike ride. You don't have to work up a huge sweat. I know that living in DC in the summertime, that's a hard thing to do. Um, but get out, do something else. Free your mind up from your current situation and focus on something like how to get to Hyattsville and back. Take a vacation, go someplace cool. I'm going to Budapest in December. I'm really jacked about that. 
It's my first, like, real honest-to-God vacation since before Charlie was born. So it, you have to. You have to use your leave. It keeps you sane and you functional. Don't eschew your vacation time. Don't let it burn because then you're just giving your company back part of your compensation package. And you're worth every frickin' penny. Be that health, penny spent on health insurance, vacation time, what other organizational benefits you get, you are worth. Take them. If your organization makes it hard to take them, talk to them about that. And be honest and say, hey, look, if we can't come to some agreement here where you either pay me out money for that time because you're making it hard, so hard for me to take vacation, I, you also might have to look at going someplace else because your sanity can't be overlooked. So some useful practices, and these are different than products. Some of them are products, but you should have some useful practices to keep yourself sane. Some people think that inbox zero is a really effective task management through email maintenance process. I think it's a hell of a lot more stressful than not doing inbox zero. Um, but that's not everybody. Inbox zero may be your zen state. And that you might just go like one of these when you have reached the end of your email. And that suddenly you are at peace with the world. Um, and in, in, by the way, in the presenter's notes that are included with these slides are links to all of these things. So grab the decks after the fact, and I'll put this up on my blog too. Um, action method. Action method, again, I'm, it, it's funny, for somebody who spends all of their time doing paper things, I'm a real coveter, uh, or of digital things, I'm a coveter of paper things. I'm really excited. I brought my scorebook for the baseball game tomorrow night. Um, <laughs> So again, I love the Zen of the paper. But the action method uh, dot grid books and their action planners are superb notebooks. They have, they're meant for meetings and they give you a spot to put your takeaways at the, at, at the meetings that takes up about a third of the page on the right hand side. So that you can say, these are my five, five things that I have to do as a result of this meeting. If you're gonna have to go to meetings, you might as well benefit from them, right? So get yourself a, a good notebook. And I like the Action Method series. You can buy them online through the Ghostly store. They've kind of discontinued some of them, but the, mo most of the good ones are still available. But really, they're just well-thought-out notebooks. That's all they are. Some people love David Allen's Getting Things Done. Um, any OmniPlan folks in the house? A couple here and there. Um, another group piece of software from the Omni group that is focused on getting things done. Um, it's a series of books on staying focused and engaged. It's a little bit on the culty side. You know, I find the GTD people are like really, really GTD people, and they really like it when you are also GTD people. And, but not all cults are bad, OK? <coughs> this is the most important book that every sysadmin should own. It's 10 or 20 bucks. O'Reilly does it, which means it's available as an EPUB online. And it's time management for systems administrators. It's incredibly conversational. It is only lightly technical. But this is a man who understands your problem. And if you don't, how many people own this book? OK, everybody else buy it right now. If you're short the 10 bucks, come see me. I'll make sure that you get a copy. Um, because I, that's how important this book is. It is marvelous. It's short. It's maybe 100 pages. But it's totally worth the price. So lastly, what happens? here is important because sanity may be overrated. Some people really love living on the edge. They love living out there in the space where they're fixing the problems. I am out on the bleeding edge of life and this is where I love to be. And things get a little insane. I work too much. I do too much. I engage too much. And sanity for them may be overrated. You might decide as part of all of this that, man, that just sounds like a hell of a lot of work. That's okay. Sanity may be overrated, but in those situations, trying to be sane has value. The pursuit of sanity is the pursuit of order amid the chaos, which is kind of where we stand. We stand on the line between order and chaos for our business. By itself, that has value, and that should be considered part of your workflow. So trying to keep the sanity of your organization in play should be part of your workflow. And remember, if all else fails, keep calm and all hail the glow cloud. <laughs> How many Night Vale listeners in the house? Damn it, just one. OK, so, oh, it's not up on the screen. That would have been way better. Anyway, 
So I'm Tom Bridge. You can reach me at tom at technolutionary.com. I'm on Twitter at, at tbridge. I don't just talk about tech stuff. I talk about sports ball. I talk about local politics in DC. I talk about my son. Um, it's a conversational account, but it's a great way to reach me. Um, I also have bits.tombridge.com, which is my blog. Again, a collection of wonderful things, but that's you know not necessarily contained by anything. The only really, really technical thing that I do maintain online is my new tiny letter. Um, tinyletter.com slash technobits, and you can sign up for free. I do it irregularly. I think I've had five so far. Um, but it's a great way to kind of see what kind of stuff. It's, it's a collection of links from the Mac Infosphere. So while I leave the feedback URL up on the screen, um, we can open it up to questions and comments. So anybody have a story that they want to share or a tip that they use for keeping the demons at bay when things are all crazy? Back here in the corner. Hold on. Wait till the mic gets to you. Rum. <laughs> but why is the rum gone? Go ahead. I don't know if this is a fair question considering your workflow and mine differ just a little, but you mentioned the Omni tools, and I wonder if you had any off the top of your head suggestions for small operating teams, um, things that are uh, web-based, something I could drop on a Linux server, something like that. Do sure. You, um, I, do you yeah. mind if you if you, you don't mind that they're hosted? Um, I was going to say I always look at Basecamp, and you know, 37 Signals Basecamp product is a great team collaboration solution. I've used it to work on IT moves. I've used it to work on a personal weblog with 20 other authors. I mean, it's really flexible, does to-do lists pretty well. Um, I am contractually obligated to mention Cario's same page. Um, Cario's same page is a really excellent collaboration tool that's only getting better. Um, and it's really, you know, it's a great online tool. Again, this is something that lives up in the cloud. You can use that for free up to, I want to say it's five or ten gigs worth of storage up there. So it's fairly, they're fairly generous. Uh, and again, it's email, but you know, you get email notifications, but it's something you're expected to live in. They've got really nice, handy widgets. I'll be happy to show you at the break, but some nifty stuff there. Yep. Other questions and comments? Is everybody's brain pretty full? Oh, we got one. Lewis. I, I wanted to know if you actually have the Mac Mini server and Cario box in the DHCP range in that network diagram. Hold on, let me go back to that network diagram here. Oh, you, you wanted to know if the server, which is listed as 10, 10, 10, 14, is actually included in the DHCP range. Yes, as a matter of fact, it is, but it's reserved. So that is not an error. That is a choice. So I'm all for, uh, I'm all for setting that up as a reservation, because that way, if anything happens, at least it's preserved in that space. It's set up default on the, it's set up static on the device, but it's a reservation. So, oh, and you get my pretty picture of Penn State up there. Uh, this, is, this is satellite eyes. It's kind of fun. Um, it figures out where you are and draws a nice little watercolor map of where you are, which is neat. It's kind of spooky. Some people find it creepy. I kind of dig it. So, other kinda, questions? Kind of looks audience? like an amoeba under a microscope, kind of. Yeah, a little bit. So, uh, Rich, uh, we'll, uh, oh yeah, we'll definitely we'll talk about that. Yeah. So while uh, while the guy's walking over, uh, Russell is walking over to Rich. Um, there there is one thing: have a social group of admins in your neighbor. If you have a social group of admins in your neighborhood, take advantage of that. There's MacBrain on the West Coast. There's now MacDMV on the East Coast. There's a group of Chicago Apple admins out of Chicago area. Um, make friends for you know the, what is it Benjamin Franklin said: if uh, we will all hang separately if we don't all hang together. So. Take advantage of your community. Rich. Um, this goes back to finding t uninterrupted time. Uh, one coping strategy that I found that I worked out with my boss is that our official help desk hours are 8 to 8. Um, I don't work 8 to 8. Uh, <laughs> but I talked with my boss, and I said, can I just shift my hours for, to like 7 to 4 instead of 8 to 5, which is my usual? That gets me in roughly an uninterrupted hour every morning before our help desk officially opens. I mean, I have to get up earlier, but I also get to leave earlier. Right. And it means that I don't have to deal with the ringing phone. I can ignore the emails. And in general, it's worked out well for me because especially now we're getting slammed. So yeah. having that uninterrupted hour has been a godsend. Yeah, absolutely. Having that, having that uninterrupted time is really important. And if it means you get up a little bit earlier to do it while you're at the office, okay. That's a sacrifice worth making. 
we got two more here. Lewis, you already asked a question, so we'll go to Damien first. Uh, while my school has, or my team has recently moved all of our documentation over to Evernote business notebooks, uh, for a long time we were successfully using uh, Apple's Wiki. Yeah. Right into, you know, 10.7 server, 10.6 server uh, for documentation. Absolutely. So, uh, use I'm, use the tools at your disposal. The wiki server is a great way to do that. You know, it doesn't cost it anything, and it's easy to use and pretty easy to set up. Yep. So uh, you've got one. We'll move the mic across. Can we hands across America, the mic across to up front? Thank you. Um, just as a little tip that you mentioned, like, you know, get a good amount of sleep and whatnot. Um, just a little tip, something I found a few months ago as, as sort of like a pseudo life hack. There's a great little app called Flux or Flux, and it's available for Mac, Windows, and that sort of thing. If you find yourself working on the laptop, which we all do, later in the evening hours, like, you know, I've got, oh, God, I think I just figured out that script or whatever the case, Flux basically changes the temperature, and the, you know, the Kelvin temperature of your screen, your monitor, because they've shown that, you know, basically that monitor is throwing out bright, bright daylight rays into your head and it screws up with your circadian rhythms. And if you find yourself suddenly, I can't sleep, I'm restless, why, I'm exhausted, it's one o'clock in the morning. If you install Flux, it helps you get to sleep at night. And just in the past few months, I've really noticed that I sleep much, much better because I am one of those idiots who decide to get off of the 19-inch monitor at work or the 21-inch monitor at work and go home and look at a 13-inch monitor at the right. house. So it's really, really helpful. Cool. Pass the microphone back to Luis. I just wanted to comment on, uh, you mentioned vacations and all those things, and um, there was a time when I was on my own and uh, had never really taken a vacation that I could speak of because it was just not possible. You'd go, and the first thing I'd do off the plane is check my email, something's burning, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, so I found that um, having a, a, an actual communication plan with my clients was one of the most valuable things I've done in the last few years, and that involves having a, a very, very... Um, precise list of every user at every client that I email uh, very systematically right before I leave, a mm -hmm. uh, week before I leave, yep. letting them know I'm traveling, when my travel hours are, when I'm on a plane and not available, that kind of thing. And it only takes you know a couple paragraphs of text, but that actually goes a long way because people are very considerate um, yes. if they know. Yes. But if they don't know and you're just not uh, available, then it becomes right. a problem. Absolutely, 100% agree. And that's one of those great things where you can, you, we, we always had a conference. When I was working in-house at NC, we had a first class system. And there was a first class system called DC News. And everybody would put up a, I would put up a where's Tom kind of thing. And so where's Tom? Tom is on a plane to Atlanta. He will land at X amount of time. He will respond to email for an hour. He will be gone for the rest of the week. Please contact Joel or Mark at the following information and things along those lines. Talking to your clients about your vacation needs, it's important. They care too. So. Last year was our first year of rollout for, uh, or was our first year we rolled out Max to all of our uh, high school students. And it, of course, anybody who's ever done that for the first time knows that's a very stressful experience. And one thing that my boss, uh, having m managed his own company before, he, he told me, he said, look, he says, as soon as this is over, he says, make sure all of your, make sure all of your stuff is tied up and then take your, make sure all the loose ends are tied up and then take you a week. And he he basically forced me to do that, and uh, it was a good it was a good move because yep. uh, I basically went undisturbed for that amount of time because we had already gotten most of the kinks worked out. So whenever you're faced with a really big task and you know that it's going to take a lot out of you, mm -hmm. you know, take that time, make sure that everything is, make sure your loose ends are tied up, and then and then take that time to get away. Absolutely, and, uh, and you're going to be much more refreshed. And, and that goes along with that organizational calendar that you're creating as part of this process, is that if you've got a set of deadlines that you understand and know, don't schedule a vacation like right on top of one, or near one, or right before one. It, you, that, that's, just, that, that's just recipe for hurting yourself or hurting your organization. And then that puts your organization in a difficult position. So um, think about that kind of stuff. Sometimes that may change the way you're the tenure of your the tenor of your voca of your vacations. That may happen. So, thanks everybody. You guys have been an awesome audience. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>